Okay, so as you know, your assignment is due uh, next class. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look over it. Is there, does anyone have any questions about it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I, someone mentioned this, I think, last time when I asked it. Uh, so it's the free, don't don't buy anything. Um, it's the tracker and ad blocker extension. Yeah. Uh, you should specify which guidelines you're using so the TA knows uh, what to market. And the, the ones with the errors, I'll just pull them up. So G4 and G5 are the ones that... Uh, oh, sorry, you don't want to use G4 or G5 at all? Uh, so you don't think that a user will commit an error ever? Okay, okay. Well, anyways, keep it, and if you don't reference it, it's fine. Uh, but you can keep it in your list and, and then just never reference it. Maybe at the very end, say, why uh, for G4 and G5, you, you didn't have anything. Uh, sorry, say again. Like learning what the objective is. For example, we have uh, three objects. Can we use it as a core task? Uh, not really. Like a core task is what the user wants to do with it. So the objectives are what the developer wants. So th they're not quite. You can you can certainly try and match your core tasks to the objectives. That's fine. Uh, but but the core task a, a task is something that the user wants to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Just try to make sure it doesn't add up to more than a page of screenshots. And you don't have, you don't need a screenshot. Like you want to describe it in words, but sometimes it's just it's easier to show a picture, and so that's the only time you need a screenshot. You don't have to try and have lots of screenshots. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch. Can everyone quiet down? Uh, I didn't catch the second half. Then, then, then that's fine. So you, uh, the core task is is something the user wants to do. Yeah, yeah. So the and then uh, if the user would fail to do their core task, then that's um, then it's going to fail either because of G one or G two. Yeah. So you'll never uh, you'll you'll never get to like G three. So that's not a good core task because that's more of a property of this. Like the user should be able, like the user is going to do this kind of thing. That's like a task is, like I give you a list of tasks. I want you to go do them kind of thing, right? So I wouldn't say like, um, here's a list of tasks. A grocery store should make it obvious where the milk is. That's not a task. That's a property of the grocery store, right? But if I say go get the milk, or, or get milk at the grocery store, then that's a task. So you want to reframe, like like a task is is what the user is going to do, and it is possible that they are not able to do it, right? Like they they get stuck halfway and they can't figure it out. Um, but but yeah yeah. So your your core tasks are sounding more like properties than core tasks. Yeah, so users can have expectations. Like, I expect that the store has milk, mm -hmm. right? So that's an expectation. But the task is still go go get the milk. Mm -hmm. And then let's say the store doesn't have milk, right? Mm -hmm. Then I would say, oh, like, I you know, it failed under G2 or whatever. I, I couldn't get the milk because there was no milk kind of thing, right? Um, so that's, that's a task. So an expectation or a property aren't tasks. Right. But they, they, they have something to do with tasks, like, like you're 
you know what you know what the task is. You're just not framing it as a task. You're framing it as an expectation instead. So you got to turn it into a task. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can, uh, it's common when you walk through, you might say, okay, here's a step where uh, it might be confusing for normal users or whatever. Like a, a normal user might like fail, it might fail under G7, but like for an expert user, it's fine kind of thing. Yeah. So you can, uh, you shouldn't, you could, there's different ways of doing it. There's no right way or wrong way. You could do a walkthrough as a novice user and a walkthrough completely as an advanced user. But generally, as you sort of comment on things, you're just sort of like, okay, like, yeah, novice user might get stuck here. Medium user might go through and an expert would know what's going on type of thing. Yeah. So you can make remarks like that. So it, it's not that, that if there's a problem with one of the guidelines, it's not necessarily a problem for 100% of the users. You can say it's a, it's a problem for some set of users. Yeah. And remember, these things are designed for everyday users. These aren't expert tools. They're marketed towards, like, Ghostry and EFF, they want everyone in the room to be running these extensions. So they're supposed to be anyways for, for novice users. Oh, OK, uh, any other questions? OK. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, policies and procedures. So this will. Uh, make up the last three lectures. And so today we'll go through an example that all of us know, like we understand because we've, we've probably all gone through it ourselves, uh, just to get an idea of what we're looking for. Uh, we're going to talk about airport security. And then uh, the next two classes we'll, we'll take what we learn from just sort of doing a kind of not a very technical subject and then we'll apply it to a more technical subject. So there's a policy that's uh, implemented in, in the browser uh, called the same origin policy. And there's something called the, the cookie policy too, which is closely related. They, they both have to do with origins, deciding on, on whether to do things depending on what website you're visiting essentially is what it boils down to. So um, same origins, more about like, I have some JavaScript, it's running on a website, can it control the complete website or am I putting it in a box and saying, oh, you can control everything in this box, but you can't control everything else. And then cookies, your browser's deciding, oh, I got a cookie, uh, this website wants it, do I send it or not? Uh, and so there's, there's a policy, it's a little tricky to define, uh, and decisions that were made in the 1990s uh, had consequences, you know, like now I would say that the policies are, are pretty good, um, but the, the initial policies that were designed, they were designed before the modern web. Modern web came, it kind of changed where you're pulling content in, and then it, it kind of rubbed up against the policies in a bad way. So there's all sorts of attacks that you've heard of, like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, click jacking, all of these really come down to the same origin policy. The, the same origin policy is what uh, what, what allows these attacks to happen. So we'll, we, we aren't going to focus on the technical details of the attacks. You'll see that in 6120, I think, or 3040, whatever the network security one is. You'll, you'll learn every type of cross-site scripting there is. I don't really care about that so much. I just, I want you to understand why it was the decision of the browser makers that caused these attacks in the first place. Okay, that's, that's more the, the um, content for this course for this course, okay? <coughs> okay, but uh, before we do that, let's uh, look at airport security. Okay, so this is a process and a procedure that, that probably everyone's flown uh, before, uh, so you've gone through this. Uh, we know that there's security involved. Like we literally say like, oh, you're going to walk through security or something like that. So it has something to do with security. Uh, but there is more that, that maybe you think about uh, with the whole song and dance of, of going on an airplane and flying somewhere. Okay. Um, so, okay, let's say we want to fly somewhere. Uh, we want to go to the Caribbean over Christmas. 
or maybe you want to go back to your home or wherever, uh, what's the very first thing that you do? Okay, so we have to get our ticket. So purchase our ticket. And this is actually where things start. Okay, so I purchase a ticket, that's fine. Uh, you know, I get the price or whatever I buy, let's say on Expedia. Uh, so now I have the ticket. Now let's say it turns out that I can't fly for whatever reason, I get sick. So I wanna give the ticket to you, that's okay, right? Okay, why is that, why is that not okay? Okay, okay, so tickets are tied to your name. Say linked to an identity. Um, okay, you said it was tied to your passport. Do you have to show your passport to buy a ticket? If I go on Expedia, do I have to like take a photo of it and upload it or something like that? People are saying no. Sorry. Okay, okay, so sometimes you'll, you'll attach it to it itself, but there's no actual ID check. So if you knew my name, my passport number, or whatever, you could book a ticket for me, yeah. right? Could you board the plane for me? No. Okay, okay. So at the ticket step, there's no, there's no ID check. So you don't have to show your passport or something like that. Okay, and everything I, I say, uh, first off, it will be in the context of Canada, so different countries have different policies and procedures. Uh, and the second thing is I'm gonna assume that we're flying internationally. Okay, so we're gonna cross a border. If we fly domestically, actually I'll, I'll mention it sort of as we go through, but the, the procedure for flying within Canada is a lot different, it's a lot more relaxed than, than the procedure for, for flying internationally. So for example, uh, if I fly domestically, I don't even need a passport. So if I don't, if I have, I need ID of some sort, photo ID, but I can have a driver's license and I can fly to Toronto uh, with a driver's license. But if I wanna fly internationally, then I, I need a passport. Okay, so why are tickets li linked to an identity? Like, why not just, you know, if it's a train ticket, I can give it to you, you can take the train. I think that's true. Uh, I think probably for a bus as well. Uh, so why, why do we want to tie these to an identity? Uh, but you're not showing your identity, so you could impersonate. Like, I could book a ticket under your name. I'll have trouble flying eventually down the line. But. So it's not impersonation. Yet. We'll, we'll try and catch that later. Does Expedia do anything? Okay, let, let, let me uh, put this a different way. Okay, so I purchased my ticket, uh, so that's fine. I uh, put in my credit card number, I press enter, it goes, it checks Visa, you know, that might take a few seconds or whatever, but it comes back and it's like, okay, you paid, the payment went through, so do I have the ticket in my hand then? Not a physical one, but is the ticket basically purchased at that point? Okay, so usually not. Usually what will happen is, it, is they'll say, we're going to confirm it, and then a day later you get a confirmation uh, that your ticket, like you'll get a receipt and stuff for purchasing the ticket, but it's not confirmed yet, okay? So what's, what's taking them a day? Why is Expedia waiting around? Okay, so that's exactly it, okay? So this answers both questions. Um, so as you know, not everybody can fly internationally. Uh, so countries maintain no-fly lists, so Canada has one. And so the reason that it's tied to your name is because they're gonna take your name then and check it against the no-fly list. The reason it takes a day or whatever, a couple hours for it to be confirmed is because that check is taking place. And um, uh, who does this particular check? So the government maintains the list, right? But you're buying the ticket from Expedia, right? 
So what does Expedia have the list or, or how does it work? And so the answer is that, well, Expedia has to go, usually what would happen in Expedia's case is they would go to Air Canada if you're flying Air Canada. Air Canada would take your name and give it to the government and then the government's going to look at it and then they're just going to say yes or no, okay? So the list itself, no one can see it. No one knows what Canada's list looks like. Um, so it looks sort of like this. So I say, okay, this is, I assert who I am and I pay my money to say Expedia. Expedia will take my money. It will make sure that the transaction and, and all that stuff is okay. Then it will forward my ID uh, to Air Canada. So I might get a receipt kind of right away just for the purchase. And then if, assuming I'm flying Air Canada, it will say, okay, this person's trying to book a, a ticket uh, for Air Canada. Uh, the Air Canada needs to keep track of it anyway because eventually I'm going to show up on a plane. Like when you go to the airport, there's no Expedia booth, right? There's an Air Canada booth. So they, they need to know it anyways. And if I directly bought from Air Canada, then I just skip the Expedia set. Uh, but otherwise it looks the same. Um, so the user could just directly go and buy it from the airline. Uh, and then they show it to the government. Government's going to check it against uh, what's called the no-fly list. And they're going to say, you know, yes, this person can fly or no, this person can't fly. And then assuming that, that it's authorized, uh, then Air Canada will confirm the ticket. And then you'll get an email, you know, a bit later from Expedia saying, okay, you're your flight is confirmed, uh, and, and these are the details. Okay, so the no-fly list, um, all, all the government really gets, they get your identity, okay? Uh, what does identity mean in this case? So like, for example, do you have to put your social insurance number? That's a unique identifier for you if you're Canadian. Would you put that in if you're booking a ticket? No, you're basically just putting your name in, okay? So this this is, it might take in a little bit more information, like your known address or things like that, but it's basically based on names itself, okay? So what happens if you have the same name as a terrorist that's on the no-fly list? Uh, yeah, well, the, your credit card will go through. They'll probably reimburse you, but, but you'll get an answer back that says, no, you can't fly, okay? And this happens routinely in Canada, uh, a lot of times it happens to like toddlers. So it will make the news if it happens. So like someone will be flying with their kid, their kid will be two years old and they'll be on the terrorist watch list. And so they won't be able to fly. And then it, of course that's newsworthy. So then there's a big article about it and a picture of the kid, you know, and, uh, and everyone's like, oh, this is a disaster, you know, whatever. But eventually you can, you can sort of appeal it but it's sort of an opaque process and then eventually, I don't know, you could fly or something like that. So it seems that there are ways to like get, get an exemption made uh, and no one really knows the details of it. So it's like very opaque, like no one, uh, it's not public what the list is, what the procedure is or anything like that. And it usually takes the media to make a big deal out of a case before you uh, get a response, um, but, but anyways. Okay, and this is also why I can't get my ticket to you because the ID check was done in my name. So if I gave it to you, then you would have to do the whole ID check again with the other name. And so that's basically like buying a new ticket. It's like me getting a refund, giving you the money, you going and buying a second ticket. Um, so tickets aren't transferable directly. You, you basically, I, yeah, we could transfer it. Like I could cancel my ticket and you could book an, one under your own name, but you're going to have to go through this whole process uh, yourself. Okay, uh, so we have our ticket, we buy it, we purchase it, we're confirmed. Now we wanna go to the airport. And uh, what's the first thing that we would do at the airport if we didn't do anything online? I know, I know now that there's options to do things online, but let's assume you didn't have a phone, uh, you're flying old school, 
And so uh, what's the very first thing you'll do when you go to the airport? Who will you talk to? What, what will you do? Okay, so you're going to check in. Who are you checking in with? Okay, the airline. Are you talking to a human? Maybe. Sometimes you have a, there's, there's ATM style, like kiosk machines, so that, that could be enough. Okay, so what are they uh, asking for, or what's, what, what do you remember from what they asked for? Okay, so you, okay, so some sort of ID? Your ticket, okay, so your boarding pass, so they'll, they'll give you uh, some sort of uh, uh, either digital, so if you check in online, uh, you'll get a digital boarding pass and if you uh, do the kiosk, they'll, they'll print it out uh, on a piece of paper. Or if you go up to the human being, they'll do the same thing. Uh, what else? Question implies you are not carrying much Okay, so they won't ask you that. The airline won't ask you that. So the, we can save that till later. I mean, they might make sure just as a courtesy, but they're, that, they're, it's not their job to police that type of thing. Luggage? Okay, so luggage is the other one. Okay, so basically boarding pass identity luggage. Okay. So we'll obtain uh, boarding pass and check page. Okay. Now let's say that I uh, let's say I do it online from my phone. Do I have to show my passport to my phone? Is there someone that's looking through the camera doing the identity check? So we mentioned that there is an identity component here. Okay, but do, you, do, do, does anyone see that the person, you know, asking for the boarding pass on the phone is the same person that, that the ticket's for? So obviously not, right? So the answer is no. If you go to a kiosk, they'll ask you to scan uh, the passport often, but is there someone that's going to check that passport against your face? So it depends, yeah. So the answer is not necessarily. So they might, but the newer ones, they do, they're a little fancier. And in different countries, the rules might be different. But I have gone to kiosks before where they take a picture of you. I can't remember, though. I don't think they do that at sign-in. I don't think I've, I don't remember. That's more like when you're going through customs. Yeah. Uh, so let's say not. Now, if you go to the human desk, right, they probably are going to look at the passport and look at your face kind of thing, OK? But the point is the identity check is optional. Okay. Usually they want to have a copy of your passport. So on your phone app, you're going to put the information in. Uh, same with the kiosk. You often have to scan your passport. Okay. So you're getting a boarding pass. The boarding pass is stapled to a scan of your passport. But no one's checking whether you're really the person on the passport. Right. So all they're doing is they're really comparing the name on the ticket to the name on the passport, which is what they did already right at the first step okay so there's no real there's nothing really new here from an identity perspective uh you're they're, they're not identifying you no one's looked at your face uh unless if you go up in person uh but, but basically if if you really wanted to get through this step without like under a false name you know then you would do it from your phone and, and this step isn't going to stop you okay So you can do this online. Um, you can use a kiosk is, is just a fancy name for like the computers that are sitting there. Uh, or you can go to the counter. And here there's basically going to be no ID check. By ID check, I mean like checking you versus your identification. So ID check could be like none. It could be like a scan of passport or putting your passport information. But no check against your face. Or it could be like I, I check the passport and I look at your face. So at this stage, it would either be this or this. 
uh, but it's not going to be this level. Okay, so now I have a boarding pass. What, uh, okay, what does the boarding pass do? Why, why do I need a boarding pass? To board the flight, that's what it allows me to do. What, let me put it a different way. What information is on the boarding pass? Okay, so my seat number, my row number, that kind of thing, so where I'm sitting. Uh, my name is on the boarding pass or not? Okay, so I have the name, I have the seat number, yeah, destination, what, what, basically what airplane I'm taking, what my flight is, what airplane it is, what gate it's at, maybe the gate, where I'm going to sit on the airplane. So all the air, the air details. Um, okay, so we, my ID is on it. All the flight info. And uh, sometimes there's like small perks that you might get. So this is more of a US thing, but there's something called TSA Express uh, where you can go to, when you go to the security line, uh, there's faster lines and slower lines. Uh, so you, you might be able to go to the faster line. That's going to be on the boarding pass itself. Um, so faster security. Also, when you board the plane, uh, they do it by zone. Uh, so if you want to get on the plane early, you'd have to have a priority boarding. Uh, so that, that type of thing uh, would also be on the boarding pass. Okay, now the boarding pass itself, uh, let's say you want to fake a boarding pass. You want a fake boarding pass. Could you make a fake boarding pass? Okay, people are saying no, so why not? Okay, so there's a QR code on it. First off, is there anything special about the paper? Is it like paper money where you can't forge it? No, there's nothing. Sometimes they print it on like kind of fancier, like if you go to the counter. If you go to the kiosk, it's just like receipt paper. Uh, and if it's on your phone, it's literally nothing. Okay, so there's no, um, so let's think about forgery. There's often some sort of encoding of the information. So why do they put it in a barcode or a QR code? So at various points in the line, someone might ask to see your security or your boarding pass and then you'll scan it. So it's just a quick, a quick way of getting the information that's on the boarding pass into a computer, okay? Is there any security on, it's just because there's a QR code Right, I said, could you forge it? And everyone said, no, 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 there's, there's a QR code. Well, why can't I just make a fake QR code? Okay, okay. So let's say, um, okay, so first off, you can fake a QR code. Uh, and the only way that you couldn't fake it, it's not because of the QR code itself. It would be because the data itself was signed. Okay, so there would be some sort of digital signature. So let's assume that there was a digital signature for a second. Who, who would sign it? So Air Canada. So remember the whole root CA, HTTPS thing, certificates and all that stuff. Okay, so Air Canada... Um, so I get my ticket out of the kiosk. Does that mean the private key for all of Air Canada's boarding passes are sitting on that kiosk because it's going gonna, it's gonna to digitally sign it for me? And then let's say someone scans the thing 
right? And it's like, oh, it's signed by Air Canada. How do they know Air Canada's public key? Like, is there a certificate on there? Is it like running, does it have like a root store, like a certificate store? Okay, so signing, this is one of the lessons also from HTTPS. It's easy to just say, oh, just sign it. But if you, unless if you figure out who's signing it, when are they signing it, where's the private key when they're signing it, how do you know the private key can't be stolen? And then on the verification side, how do I know it's that person's public key? And what if someone lies about Air Canada's public key? Then are they going to, you know? And so that whole thing is called PKI, right? Public key infrastructure. And so the PKI is too messy. You have too many airlines. Uh, you know, you, you absolutely can't have like kiosks with private keys and things like that. Um, and so the answer seems to be that there's no digital signatures on these. So it's just a QR code. It's just straight up. Um, this may have changed. Uh, but at least I'll, I'll put until recently, not, not because I know that it changed, but it, at least uh, we know for a fact that there weren't signatures, you know, as of a couple of years ago, but I don't know when the last time is someone's checked. Okay, so there's basically no digital signature. So let's go back to the first question. Can I forge a boarding pass? If I want priority boarding and I want to go to TSA Express, could I just print out a fake or get a fake QR code on my phone? Uh, and, and then I could just read their QR code and then I could just change it, right? From zone D to zone A or whatever. Uh, is that possible? And the answer is yes. At least it was possible. You know, every airline's different and things like that. So I'm, I'm not saying it will always and forever be possible, but, but it, it certainly was possible until recently. Let's say it was possible historically. Perfect question. Just hold on to that question for a sec. Uh, possible to forge uh, historically. And there were websites where you could go and you could like type in what information you wanted on a boarding pass and it will create the QR code for you. And um, yeah. Okay, so the question is, uh, Air Canada does know, like let's say you went with a fake boarding pass, right? Could Air Canada look at that boarding pass, compare it to the information they have and decide that it was fake? Yeah. So the answer is yes, okay? So you can create a fake boarding pass, but if Air Canada is the one that's scanning it, then, uh, then it doesn't matter, like they're, they're gonna just pull up your record and they'll, they'll see that it's fake, okay? But what if anybody else scans it. Is there anyone else that looks at your boarding pass besides Air Canada? Yeah, so like security officers and things like that, are, do they have a back-end access to Air Canada? We don't necessarily know the answer to that, but it seems no, okay? So for example, let's say I have the TSA Express on my, pa on my fake passport, right? And then I go to the security line and the person scans it, right? They're not like plugged into to Air Canada, right? So they don't know that it's fake, okay? Eventually, when I show up at the gate and I'm about to get on my flight and I change my seat number, they're, they're not going to be like, they're going to be like, well, in our database, it says you're sitting here. I don't care what your ticket says, right? Um, so, so, so anyway, so yeah. So you can forge it, but you can only show it to some people, but not all people, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, when you're about to board the flight itself. And there it is, Air Canada, that's running that kiosk. So those people have access to it. So when you get to that step, we'll get there eventually in our kind of like in, in, in everything that we do. But when we get there, then you, you can't show a fake boarding pass. It's not going to help you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess your point is, sorry, uh, that, that it doesn't make sense to fake the priority boarding. Yeah, yeah, so that's actually probably true. This thing is, it's probably makes sense to forge and, and not this, yeah. Okay, 
So just because there's a QR code doesn't mean anything. Uh, you can decode. Well, I'll just. Okay, so we now have our boarding pass. Uh, it's fine, maybe it's real, maybe it's fake. Uh, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna check our luggage, assuming we have some, right? Um, okay, so. Okay, so can you, what do you do when you want to check your bag? So I have a suitcase, what do I have to do? So I show up at the airport, I go to the kiosk, I, uh, I have my boarding pass, maybe it's on paper, it's in my hand, I have my bag, what do I do with it? Okay, okay, so there's going to be some tag. So I'm not going to just throw my bag in, it's going to get mixed with everyone else's bag and then when it comes off. It's not like a bus or something like that or a train. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to tie that bag to me. Okay, so my name is going to be on it and my flight information and things like that. So at least for checked bags. Um, Okay, so there's going to be a name on it. And this is essentially for like non-repudiation. So you can't be like, oh, that wasn't my bag. So if you remember from Stride, that's what we're going for. Uh, if we want to put everything in terms of Stride, forgeries as spoofing. Okay, then we take it, we drop it on a conveyor belt. And then the bag disappears, right? And we don't see it again until maybe we see it getting loaded onto the airplane if we're watching. Uh, but we basically don't see it until we landed and hopefully it showed up uh, where it's supposed to show up. Okay. Uh, does anyone look at your bag between you putting on the belt and you getting it when you go into the destination? Okay. So we don't know all the inner details, but there's been enough like documentaries and things like that where they show uh, what happens behind the scenes. And so, yeah. It's inspected, absolutely 100%. Um, so there's going to be security screening. You think after they put it on? Yeah, after you put it on the belt, it will go off somewhere, and then it's going to get screened. We'll, we'll say in a sec what the screening is. Uh, but before we do, who's, who's doing the screening? So let's say I'm flying Air Canada. Is Air Canada looking at my bag? Okay, who is it? Okay, so it's a security or whatever. So are, are they police? Okay, are they customs? Okay, okay. So this is a little confusing, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just try and keep this straight. So there's three things that people tossed out, and they actually all are slightly different, okay? So you have customs, which in Canada is called the Canada Border Services. You have law enforcement, which is police. Uh, so sometimes we call it LEO law enforcement officers, uh, but you could think of like, it could be the RCMP, that would be federal, uh, in Quebec it could be the Quebec police, uh, SEQ, no, yeah, yeah, that's a bus, no? Yeah. Um, they're kind of like police you, and then, or it could be Montreal if it's at the Trudeau airport, so like, uh, which law enforcement agency you deal with, I'm not sure, okay. Um, so border services are cared about when you cross the border. RCMP, are, they care about when there is a crime. So let's say they look at your bag and they find something, then it, they'll turn it over to RCMP. But there's another agency that's called TSA, or in Canada it's called the CT, C, C -A, C -T TSA. Whoops. 
And their job is basically to make sure that you fly safely. Okay? And so as we see as we go through this, uh, these three people, they have different objectives. So we, we just think of them as government. It's the government or it's the police, right? Or it's security or whatever. But their goals are actually slightly different uh, in terms of, of what they're, they're trying to do. Okay? So the security screening here happens by CTTSA. And then later, if you're crossing a border, it might also happen by CBS. Okay, so these guys for sure will look at it, and these people, uh, you know, maybe. If you go across a border, they'll, they'll be in charge of it. Okay, so there's two kinds of screening that happen. Uh, there's one type of screening that happens on every single bag that does not involve you opening the bag. Okay, so it's just external. So yeah, x-ray. So all bags basically go through an x-ray machine, as far as we know. Is there any way, is there any other way that I could try and tell what's in your bag without mm -hmm. opening it? Say it loud. Animals, okay, so dogs usually are used. Okay, so these, these are the two uh, things that you see. Uh, and then uh, if they, they really want to, they can open your bag. Uh, can you lock your bag? So you can buy locks, you've probably seen them at stores. So how does that work? What if TSA want to look in your bag and it's locked? Okay, okay. So there's two types of locks. Um, there's a normal lock. In that case, they'll just cut it. And they're not responsible for replacing it. Or there's like a TSA approved lock. And this is a lock that has two keys that open it. So one is your key that's unique to you. So me and you, we both go in the store. We both buy these locks. My key can't unlock your lock, and your key can't unlock my lock. Okay. So you have a user key. And then TSA have like kind of like a master key that can unlock all of these. Okay, now this also is subject to kind of, like we could think about everything I just said about digital signatures. I know this is like analog, it's locks and keys, right? But we still have a kind of PKI problem here, okay? So this sounds good in principle, right? You just, TSA have their own key so they can unlock it and the user has their keys. You can definitely make locks where more than one key can unlock it kind of thing, okay? But how does TSA get the master key? Like how, how does this whole thing work? Like, how, how is it that TSA, like, I buy my lock here in Montreal. Like, how, how is it guaranteed that the TSA officer that's at the Trudeau Airport can unlock that? You know, I bought it from Walmart, like, from a manufacturer. Like, like how, how did that whole thing happen? Okay, okay. So the, the manufacturer has to know the master key. Okay, so they, they, they're making the locks with that in mind. Okay. So that's the certificate kind of process. So the root certificate is kind of like this master key and the companies that create the locks, they have to know that certificate. Okay, so they're kind of like certificate authorities because they can, they're creating locks, not the keys themselves. Someone would have to manufacture the keys as well. Uh, but, but by manufacturing a lock that would be opened by this key, you basically have to know the, the, what the key looks like. Um, so they all know the key, uh, so that's fine. And then the TSA agents themselves, so how many of these keys are there in the world, for example? So these master keys, is it like there's like five of them? Okay, so we need at least one per airport, right? So how many airports are there? Hundreds, thousands. Okay, so we need at least a thousands of these. And do you think there's just one person in that airport that has the key? No, they give them to everyone, right? Like you work for the TSA. So how many people work for the TSA at Trudeau? 
I don't know, maybe 100, right, times 1,000 airports or whatever. Okay, so there's, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million of these keys, these master keys that unlock every single lock floating around, okay? Now, what's the chances that just once one person got this key and they gave it to someone who, like, I don't know, put it on the internet and gave a file for how to 3D print this key? Okay, it just takes one person once to do that, right? And then now it's leaked, right? And so everyone has it. And so that happened almost immediately. So they rolled out this whole system and it was really fancy and everyone was excited. You know, you didn't have to cut your locks and you could lock your luggage. And then I don't know what the time frame was that went by, but it was a very short period of time. And then all of a sudden on the internet, you could buy these keys or you could download the file and they unlock every single lock, okay? And what do you do then? So you could create a new master key, but then the manufacturers all have to change. All the keys that are on the store shelves, like it was at Walmart, Walmart got this, the lock six months ago, they'd have to pull that off and say, oh, that one doesn't work. Maybe they have two keys, so the old ones would work or whatever, right? But then it would just get leaked again, right? So they, they just said, you know, forget it. Like, we'll just, we'll keep selling these locks, people will keep buying them, but there's no, there's no actual security there. It's just theater. So let's say there's probably millions in circulation. And so it, it takes one, one leak to compromise the whole thing. And so it did leak uh, quite. Okay, uh, the last thing about uh, bags are, let's say that, I don't know, we're, we're on a long flight, it's like 10 hours, and I forgot my toothbrush and it's in my bag, but I checked it. Can I like go down and, and get my toothbrush out of my bag? Okay, so I'm not allowed to do that, right? But could I, if I wanted to, let's say I was the pilot of the plane and I really wanted to do it, could I do it? Is it just that you're not allowed or is it that it's like physically isolated? Right, right, right. Yeah, so the, yeah, the, if you're a pilot or something, you would probably carry your luggage on, even if it was too big to technically carry on. But all the checked bags are physically isolated from it, so you can't access it, okay? And then this also uh, gives some protection to the plane as well. So let's say that you had a bomb in your bag. You managed to get the bag on the plane without an x-ray or a dog uh, detecting it, right? Then, uh, then it would be in an isolated compartment of the plane. Okay, so if it was a minor explosion, it wouldn't necessarily uh, bring down the plane or hurt people that were in the, the passenger, in the cabin of the plane. Now, it's not just security for this in mind. Um, uh, the, actually, I, I'm not 100% sure about what I, what I was going to say is, I, I think that, so obviously a cabin has to be pressurized so you can breathe, right? Uh, but I think, I was thinking that the baggage compartment was not pressurized, but I know some people travel with pets and they put their pets somewhere in the plane. So maybe they have more than one cabin, like they have a pressurized cabin uh, for, for pets. I, I don't know, I've never flown with a pet, so I don't know what the, has anyone flown with a pet before? Okay, so I don't know what the procedure is for that. But anyways, I think where your suitcase ends up is probably not pressurized. So you can even breathe there. And then if there was some leak, you know, from that chamber into the cabin, then it would depressurize the plane and things like that. So that's also why there's a physical isolation uh, between them. Okay, so that's good. Uh, so we've uh, gone to the airport, we have our boarding pass, our bag is checked. What's next? Who's the next person that we talk to? Okay. 
Okay, so there might be a country where that's done, but in Canada that isn't done. So there's no face check, passport check. I, I know in the US they do that, so uh, you, uh, I don't know if it's just for international flights, I'm not sure. I've, I've seen that happen in the US, but anyways, in Canada, if anyone knows, in Canada, who would be the next person that you talk to? First off, did I have to talk to anyone yet? No, like I could do this all online. Maybe I'm, che I'm not checking my bag, I, I just carry on. Or sometimes you can use the kiosk and print the tag and tag it yourself and drop it on it. So I could definitely be at this point without talking to a human being, okay? So I'm now leaving the gate. Where am I headed? To, sorry? Okay, so security, yeah, the search part. And uh, who do I talk to there? Who's the first person? Sorry? Customs. Okay, so it won't be customs. Customs, in my mind, means border. Uh, okay, but like, I don't mean like, like you don't have to say what agency they're from, but like just who, where are they? Is it the person that's standing behind the metal detector? Or do you talk to anyone before that? Okay, so you might not remember, but anyways, there's always someone at the start of the security line. Okay, so before you even get in the security line there's someone that's there they're going to scan your boarding pass and uh they might tell you oh you're in the wrong line or like you have to go to the other side of the airport or, or that type of thing okay so we, we call this the pre-check or pre-screening and it usually goes by so fast that you don't think about it because they're not really doing much but you they do want to see your boarding pass so you'll see people and they're like digging their boarding pass out usually they just scan it and then say okay go on kind of thing and you, you don't really think much about it okay so they're an agent at the start of the screening line In our little diagram, they work for CTSA, so they're, they're working for the same people that are running the metal detectors, and their job is to keep the airplane safe. And what they ask for is just your boarding pass. So you don't have to show your uh, passport, uh, you just have to show your boarding pass. So I'll, I'll make a note of that, I actually had it from last year, so, so uh, in US, for example, you might, you might show passport. Okay, so what, what's the purpose of these people? Why are they here? Why do they want to see your boarding pass? Okay, so they don't serve necessarily as strict security rules. A lot of it's just about logistics, so they, uh, they want to uh, route you to the right place. So they don't want you to wait in line for 20 minutes or half an hour, then you get to the security line and you realize you're in the completely the wrong line kind of thing. Okay, so part of it is about uh, routing people. Part of it is about time stamping where you are in the airport process. So let's say that your flight, let's say there's a really, really long line, right? And you're in danger of missing your flight. And then uh, they're looking on the flight itinerary and they see that you haven't checked in. Uh, the airline wants to know like, where are you in the airport? Like, did you make it through security yet? Like where, whereabouts are you? Okay, so part of this is just about uh, sort of time stamping that you entered the security line, you know, at least so many minutes before your flight, uh, which, which may help them make a decision about whether they wait for you or not wait for you. Um, and uh, that helps them track your movement. Okay, and then the last thing they might do is they might initiate some level of security screening, okay? So they obviously, they don't have a metal detector uh, sometimes people walk around with dogs and things like that, but anyway, these, these people won't, okay? Um, so what can they really screen you based on? They're, they don't know your ID, they're not looking at your passport. All they see is, you know, they ask for your boarding pass and they tell you go line up somewhere else. So what, 
what could they possibly be looking at in terms of screening? Okay, okay. So they'll make sure that you behave like you uh, match all the rules and things like that. So, uh, so that's more of a courtesy because like later you'll get caught like trying to get your water bottle through or whatever. Okay, so what they often do, at least in the US, so we don't know, like not everything about public, like airport security is public information. Uh, but what we know from the US is that uh, they do kind of like, kind of like in social engineering, uh, they're looking, uh, they're basically psychologically profiling people. Okay, so they're trying to see if you are exhibiting any suspicious behaviors. Okay, so in the US, there was uh, a program that journalists kept asking the government. Governments are compelled sometimes to give information. Uh, so you can always go to the government and say, hey, I want information about this, I want information about that. And then they have a process for deciding whether to release it publicly or not. Um, actually, in this case, I think if I recall correctly, it was, um, uh, it was leaked to a journalist. So someone who worked for the TSA, had a, they knew about this program, and so they just sort of leaked uh, the document. I, I can't remember, but anyway, somehow it, it became public, uh, so I can show it to you. So it's called Spot. And uh, this is maybe a little small. Okay, it's not, the text isn't this is super clear. Um, whoops. Okay, it's hard for me to scroll around with it going back. But I'll try my best. Okay, so the SPOT program, it's a point-based system. So basically, they're going to look for certain indicators, and if they see the indicators, then they're going to give you a point. And if you get enough points, then they're going to do something about it. Okay, so just because you get a point doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get, there's going to be some consequences. Um, okay, so these are things that, that get you uh, one point. So if you arrive late for a flight, uh, if you're, Face is pale from recently shaving your beard. Uh, if you, uh, if you're flushed, your face, you know, when you're in security line, you know, that type of thing. If you're rubbing your hands, if you have bad body odor, uh, these types of things. So these will get you one point. Uh, so this, these are meant to indicate whether you're stressed. Uh, fear is another one. Uh, so if you have bulges in your clothing, a cold penetrating stare, uh, if you're like looking around, like kind of paying attention, like where are the security cameras, where are the security agents, like that type of thing, uh, then, then they might do it. Uh, widely open staring eyes, um, so you can see lots of things. Uh, and then uh, there's deception too. So if you look like you're wearing a fake mustache or something, I don't know, in disguise, uh, if you're asking security related questions, uh, if it looks like you're communicating secretly with someone else that's in line, uh, these, these are the bad ones, so they'll get you uh, three points. And then uh, if, uh, if you're a member of a family, though, then they'll take points off. Uh, if you're a married couple uh, where you're both over 55 years old, then they'll take two points off whatever you got. And uh, low risk is defined as females over 55 years old and male over 85 years old. So if uh, you get up to three points, they won't do anything. Uh, if you get four to five points, they're gonna refer you to secondary screening. So secondary screening means you go into another room, then you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone and they might search you, like pat you down or, or look through your bags and things like that. And if you get six or more, they'll put you in secondary screening and they'll also notify the police. 
Uh, so the law enforcement, LEO stands for law, law enforcement uh, agency. Um, the program's kind of confusing. So then there's, uh, this is just like the first section. So this is kind of like your behavioral analysis. Uh, then they, they also consider the items. So this would be more, this wouldn't be the pre-screening person. This would be more the person that's looking at your bag or whatever. Um, so there's all this stuff that you would expect, right? Like we all know you can't travel with liquids and gels and things like that. Um, but other things that are technically legal uh, but would raise suspicion would be almanacs, blueprints, like for buildings, uh, GPS units, uh, training manuals, like for military related things. Uh, you, yeah, if you have like a lot of photographs of some high profile target, uh, a bunch of calling cards, rope, wire, duct tape, loose batteries, loose electronic components, that kind of stuff. And then uh, the last one is signs of de deception. And so these, these ones are, are really important. Um, and so anyways, you can read them. Ap Adam's apple is like in men more than women, the like thing in your throat that sticks out. So if it's kind of going up and down, uh, if you try and talk through your mouth, uh, if you're delayed in responding to questions, uh, if you're yawning in an exaggerated way, uh, if you're cl clearing your throat excessively, all of these types of things, okay? And then similarly, there's a kind of scoring system for these. And uh, if you get two to three points, then they, uh, I can't remember, they, they send you to law enforcement or, or they send you to uh, secondary screening. And then uh, these are the things that result in what they call automatic law enforcement notification. Um, so if, if your behaviors add up to more than six points across all the above criteria, uh, they have some, like, I don't know what suicide bomber indicative behaviors are. So it would be something that they're trained on identifying. Uh, disorderly passenger, or if you're interfering with screening. Uh, if you have two or more of the signs of deception, uh, if you have any kind of like firearm, uh, if you have a lot of money uh, and no reason to have that much money, uh, if you just refuse to submit to screening, uh, if you have a, a something that you're not allowed to travel with and you're hiding it and it's obvious, uh, unlawful drugs, uh, if you're doing surveillance, travel documents, I mean, everyone has travel documents. It probably means like fake travel documents or things like that. And if you're traveling with someone and they exhibit these signs, then you're going with them, essentially. Um, so anyways, this is good to know. You know, for next time you, you go through the airport, you'll be careful how often you uh, yawn and uh, how flushed your face is and things like that. Um, uh, so this was a US-based program. So we, this came from the TSA. Uh, so we don't know if Canada has a similar program or not. It wasn't leaked, uh, but it, it happened in the USA. Okay, now what, what's all this intended to do? Why, why are they doing all of this? Okay, what are they trying to stop? Okay, so terrorism is basically it, okay? So this is CTSA. They, even though like if they see that you have drugs on you, for example, they'll refer you to law enforcement, okay? They're not going to just turn a blind eye, but they don't care about drugs, right? It's not their job. Their job isn't to screen you for drugs, right? Their job is to stop a bomb from going on the plane, essentially, at the end of the day, okay? Um, so CTSA, or sorry, uh, the SPOT program is, is really about uh, it's stopping terrorism. Uh, so how successful was it in practice? So when they ran the SPOT program, uh, they, they had about 96% of people who just went through no problem. And then 4%, so this would have been post 9-11, uh, yeah. 4% were referred to law enforcement. Now, this, it can't, I, maybe it was 96 were, of all the people that went to secondary, I'm questioning these numbers, because there's no way 4%, if 100 people go through, there's no way that four people are going to law enforcement. That's way too high. Um, so I, I forget what the split is, but anyways, 4% uh, uh, were referred to law enforcement. So this might have been people who, who met the criteria 
already uh, for, for something. But, but anyways, this is the more important split, which is, okay, so some, some amount of people got referred to law enforcement, okay? So how many of these people were actually terrorists at the end of the day? Okay, so 96% of them were nothing, false positive. They were let go, there was no problem. And then that means there's 4% left, right? So these 4% were actually detained by law enforcement. Of these 4%, how many of them were, were terrorists? Because there, there could be other crimes that would get you detained. And so the answer is exactly zero. And uh, most of them were undocumented uh, travelers. So people who weren't allowed to be in a country because they didn't have the right visa or, or requirements or whatever. So this was like more than 90%. And we don't, we don't know all the exact, there might have been some drug offenses or, or things like that that were, that were mixed in there. Okay, so the, the reason that this program was leaked, it wasn't just like, oh, hey, that this is kind of cool to see what TSA does. It's the TSA agents that were tasked with implementing it, they just thought it was useless. They thought, okay, this isn't actually catching people. Uh, we tend to racially profile people when we go through the criteria. And all we're doing at the end of the day is just catching undocumented workers. And that's not even our job anyway. That's for border services to worry about. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so it was very controversial. People didn't like it, so they leaked it to the press. The press were highly critical of it. We don't know what the response is, so we don't know if TSA canceled the program or if they just they updated it or if they just continued doing it as is. We don't know. They don't have to disclose it publicly. Um, but, but anyway, that was sort of the status of it uh, back when it was leaked. Okay, now screening isn't just happening by the person that's standing there. So the person, so in the US, the, the, that would be the person that would be trained under the SPOT program uh, to, to look for this stuff. But are they the only person that's watching you? Like if, if I check in uh, to the airport and I don't have to talk to anyone because I checked in on my phone and I don't have any baggage to check, does that mean that no one's seen me until I reach this first person? No, there's surveillance, right? You have security cameras and, and all sorts of things. And there's people watching the security cameras and all of these behaviors as well, you could see potentially through a, a security uh, camera as well. So screening takes place here, uh, but you also have screening through surveillance. Yeah, so no one's done an ID check. So you could have, uh, yeah, no one's checked your ID. So that's a good point to keep in mind. Okay, what's next? So now we're in the right line, right? So now we're finally ready to go through security. So usually, probably when I started the lecture and I said, oh, we're gonna look at airport security, you probably thought we would get to security faster, okay? But there is a lot of stuff that happens before, right? Even right from when you buy the ticket to like when you're in line, your, your passport check and all that type of stuff. Uh, there's a lot happening before you even get to security uh, where the actual security kicks in. Okay, so let's uh, take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and then we'll go, we'll, I'll get you on the plane by the end of class. <laughs> And Canada lost, if anyone cares. It's one nothing.
Okay, uh, let's start again. Okay, so now we're finally ready to go through security. Um, so security is run by TSA, CTSA in Canada. And what are they looking for? Uh, they basically want to search your items, you and your items. And do they check your passport? Anyone remember? You go through security, do they want to see your passport? So no, the answer is no. Do they see your boarding pass? No. So they do actually, usually they ask for it, they ask you to scan it. In Montreal, they, uh, there's like a computer where you scan it yourself, but there's someone standing there watching you uh, right before you, you do it. The reason they're scanning it probably is, is the same reason that it gets scanned at the start of the line. It's probably more just about logistics and tracking you through through the airport rather than fulfilling any security purpose. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a search of you and your items. So how do they search the items that you're carrying? Okay, so an x-ray machine. And then would they ever open your bag or do they only use an x-ray? So they could. So there could be a search of it. Uh, animals can be used here too, dogs. Okay, what about you? What do you, how do they search you? Do they x-ray you? Okay, so you go through the machine. What is the machine? What? Okay, so it scans you. What, is it an x-ray or is it something else? Okay, so half says metal detector, half says x-ray. If you said metal detector, you're right. If you said x-ray, you're right. Uh, so it depends, so they're both, they're both right. Um, so there's the classic one is just like, there's like a box, like a frame, like a door frame and you walk through it. So that's just a metal detector. So it's only looking for metal. Um, so that's the most basic kind.
And then uh, the one where you go in and it's like a plastic enclosing and you have to like put your hands up like this and then it, this thing like whirls around. Uh, so that's a full body scan. It's a, it is an x-ray kind of. Is it not everyone goes through it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, why, 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 why doesn't everyone go through the full body scan? Okay, okay, so there, there could be some reasons why you wouldn't go through, because yeah, you have metal or something in it. I think in this case, actually, it's fine. Uh, so the metal detector will pick it up. In this case, they'll be able to see the metal implant, but it doesn't like break the machine or anything like that to go through. So the main reason is just that they're expensive. So they're super expensive, and so most airports don't have enough for everyone to go through. So I think if the airport had an, an infinite budget, then it would put everyone through, or almost everyone. Uh, there, there are a few uh, people that won't go through, like if you're in a wheelchair, for example, uh, or, or you're not, you can't stand up and do the pose, uh, those types of things, uh, then, then you might be exempt uh, from it. Uh, kids, I think, are exempt as well under a certain age. Uh, you don't walk in with your baby and, and go into that type of thing. And so uh, there are exemptions uh, for... So age, uh, you know, uh, disabilities, that kind of thing. You can also opt out if you want. So you have your, it's in your right to say, I don't, I don't want to scan, I don't want to go through the full body scanner. And it's not like, oh, you can't fly then, okay? If you're like, I don't want to go through this whole security thing, then they'll just be like, well, you can't fly and they'll refer you to law enforcement anyways. But, um, but with the full body scanner, it's within your rights to opt out and still have the right to fly. Uh, it's just that they're going to do something else instead. So the, the, the final thing that, you, that might happen uh, if you opt out is, is called a pat down. And so this is like a physical inspection over your clothes, uh, someone of the same gender presenting uh, will uh, will pat you down, and uh, yeah, yeah. So you can uh, choose to do that as well. And then they might use a wand as well, like a metal detector uh, kind of thing. Now you might get a pat down even if you don't opt out, right? So that would usually happen in secondary screening. So like we saw like the indicators and things like that that would get you in secondary screening and so you might you might get a pat down and it might be like close off pat down as well like so it could escalate uh if you go to secondary screening but that's not going to happen in the main uh security area yeah yeah so right 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 well we'll talk about that in a sec so we'll talk about what items what they're looking for. Right now, we'll just focus on, yeah, what they, uh, how they're looking for it, and then we'll look. Yeah. Uh, so secondary screening. Yeah, so pat down. Um, now, I'll, I'll say this a couple times. CTSA don't care about drugs, okay? Their, their job is to keep the airplane plane safe. Uh, so they care more about bombs than they care about drugs. And when you go through borders, though, you could still be searched as well. So CTSA aren't necessarily the only people that are, are going to search you. Um, it, it could be the border services. And so if you're going to get, yeah, searched for drugs, and yes, you can put them inside your body. Uh, and so it could be a very invasive search. Uh, that would tend to be border services. So it wouldn't happen at this stage. But, um, but anyways, yeah. But they, they may, you just might get referred to border services or law enforcement. So the, all three agencies kind of work together to some extent. But uh, the primary focus here is, is more on, on bombs and not drugs. Okay, is there any other kind of screening that might happen? Uh, so we mentioned dogs so that they can also screen you. A lot of times they're like, when I've, I've actually seen it where we're in line and they bring the dogs by and they, um, I can't remember. I, th I think they said put your bag like out in front of you. And so the dog, they weren't actually searching you. They were searching the bag, the, not you yourself. So I, d I don't know if they search you as a person, but, but anyways. Is there anything else? 
So there's one other thing I can think of that I've had happen before. So you, you go through security and instead of being like, go get your bag, they say, go over here. And they have this like, these long tongs with like a little swab on it and then they rub your hands and they might rub your bag or your zipper or things like that. And then they take it and then they put it in a machine and it looks uh, for chemicals. Uh, so this is uh, a chemical swab. And they're really, once again, this is CTSA, so they're really focused on bomb making materials as opposed to drugs. I don't know, maybe they, they test for drugs as well. Um, maybe it's easy while you're testing it, you can just run the test against everything. Um, but but the, the focus is more here. And so the idea is that uh, you could get these materials on you uh, and you wouldn't be able to detect it, but if very sensitive, uh, uh, a, a sensitive sensor could, could detect these. Okay, so the point of all of this is to stop you from going on the plane with certain items, so we call them prohibited items. And so most of them would be anything related to terrorism, a bomb, a weapon, a knife, a gun, depending on gun laws. So it depends where you're flying and whether you're authorized, and et cetera, et cetera, basically. Um, and then uh, you might get referred to law enforcement if they happen to find some items that they don't really care about themselves because uh, you can't bring a plane down with it, uh, but, but if they happen to see it, they're not going to just let it pass. So drugs, uh, a lot of cash could be fake or, or even real. Say you have a fake passport or something that, and somehow they're able to notice that it's fake. Okay, so we can't fly with bombs, weapons, knife, gun, all this stuff, drugs. Uh, what else can't we fly with? So what are some of the things that you might actually want to fly with? That's, it, that it's not, you're not, it's not terrorism, right? It's just like, I want to have a water bottle or something like that, but you're not allowed to fly with it. Okay, okay. So let's start with the aerosols and liquids. So I'll, I'll just call them liquids. And then food is more of a border service thing. Uh, so we'll, we'll get there. Um, OK, so the basic rule is uh, you can fly as long as uh, every single bottle that you have is less than 100 mil. And that all your bottles, all your 100 mil or less bottles fit inside a bag. That's a standard size. Okay, so why can't you fly with the water bottle? Okay, like the water might cause damage? But you can get water after, so once you go through, you can get it. So you can go on the airplane with a bottle of water, you just can't bring it from the outside. So why can't I bring my water from home? Why do I have to buy water for triple the price? Is it just about money? Okay. Uh, uh, say it again. Sorry. The. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it could. It's not. That's a funny reason, but yeah, it's not that. What's the real reason? Okay. So what? What would be in it that would be a problem for CTSA? Okay, so it could be some sort of chemical. So the idea is that you're going to attack someone else with it. 
Okay, okay. So yeah, and usually it, it's it's that you would make a bomb with it. So it's it, I guess it could be acid or something that you splash on someone as an attack or something like that. Uh, but the main concern they have is is that you can make a liquid bomb uh, with it. So it's about preventing liquid explosives. So it's too hard to, even though they have these chemical swabs and all this stuff, it would be too hard to, to you know, open up all your water bottles, let me take a sample of all of them and do that for all passengers. So they just say, okay, no bottles. And then this is also why, why is it less than 100 ml? Like why no liquids at all? Okay, okay. So for it to explode and cause significant damage to the plane, you would have to have a certain volume of liquid. And so uh, they, they deem that 100 ml, although you could have it like split across a couple bottles or whatever, so you could bring on a little bit more, uh, but you're not going to be able to make something big enough, at least working alone uh, with, with the restrictions. Okay, so does that mean you can never carry 100, more than 100 ml of any liquid yeah. in a single bottle? Is there any exemptions at all? Okay, so medicine would be one. Usually medicine isn't in liquid form, right? Usually it's like pills or something like that. And if it was a liquid, it's usually concentrated or something like that. But maybe there are certain kinds of medicines uh, that, that would, would be, you would have in a, in a bottle that was bigger than 100 ml, I don't know. Okay, what if I what if I'm like I'm flying to I don't know Bologna, Italy, and I so I fly to Paris first, and then I transfer. Um, and while I'm, so that example doesn't quite work. Uh, but maybe in Canada, I decide to buy a bottle of wine or something like that, and I want to take it all the way. Uh, so normally I would buy it in the secure zone, and then I would land in the secure zone, and I wouldn't leave the secure zone. But is is there some way to get like some sort of uh, duty-free, you know, liquid across a border? So the answer might be yes. So it's going to depend on like the rules and how the airport's set up and things like that. But you might be able to tra traverse security if you have it in a sealed duty-free bag and it was purchased at the same airport that's doing the screening so that they know that, okay, this is sealed. So there, there might be some reason why you could get it across, but usually you purchase duty-free stuff in when you're already through security. Um, but they, they often will seal it uh, for you. But there's no guarantee. I've also seen people who, who buy it at one airport and then they land, but they have to go through security in the second airport. And then they're like, no, we don't. Because you bought it at the other airport. We don't know what their procedures are or whatever. And, and then you have to throw it. You have to throw it out. So that's fine. Okay, anything else that anyone can think of? Anyone wear contact lenses? Okay, so if you wear contact lenses, you have this uh, like wash uh, that you can use. And for whatever reason, these things come in big bottles. Okay, it's hard to get contact lens free cleaner uh, that's less than 100 ml. And so guess what? There's an exemption for it, at least in the US. So you can bring a large bottle with you. Okay, so you want a liquid bomb? You don't put it in like your cologne, you just put it in contact lens fluid and that's it. Okay, so this, all these exemptions, or sorry, all these things are, are kind of worthless, right? If you're like, oh, well, that's, this is exempt. Um, so there's a security researcher who's very critical of, of airport security named Bruce Schneier uh, in the U.S. And so for fun, he went with a journalist and he was just showing like some of the, some of the stupid rules that, that are, are in place at airports. So one thing he did is he brought contact lens fluid just to prove it. And to really make the point, he actually brought two bottles. So he had like two like giant bottles of it and he knew that they were exempt. So he went through security 
and they pulled it aside because it showed up on the x-ray or whatever and then he's like oh i'm allowed to have it it's contact lens fluid but they're like but why do you need two bottles he's like because i have two eyes <laughs> and then they let him through with it anyways um and then uh he also faked their passport so he uh they didn't do much but they like they uh upgraded it so they could have this access to the lounge and go to tsa uh, the, the, the fast line and things like that. So he showed that, that you could fake uh, the boarding pass and uh, do things. Um, uh, there's one other exemption uh, that I've done myself personally. Uh, if you travel with a baby, uh, if you have breast milk or baby formula, you're allowed to bring whatever you want, any size uh, as well. Now there is one restriction on that. So if you just show up with a ton of breast milk, are they going to let you through? No, you have to have a baby with you, okay? And you'll notice that in that spot thing, if you're traveling with small kids, that like deducted points and things like that. So people traveling with babies are, are sort of considered less of a security threat anyways. And so, uh, but it's also just logistical, like you can't really restrict it. And you can't buy it. You could buy formula on the other side, like in the secure zone. Uh, but if you're breastfeeding, you can't, you can't buy it. Uh, and this is like expressed milk, obviously not in the breast still, uh, which is also you can carry through. Okay. Uh, that's it. Okay. Now, what else do you have to do? So, so you, um, you go through, uh, you have your liquids, you take them all out, you put them in. Uh, is there anything else that you take out of your bag? So there's something else they're always like, oh, make sure, did you, are you sure you like took out your, does anyone know? Yeah, your laptop. Okay, so they're always like, okay, laptops. Now, an iPad is fine, but a laptop isn't. Um, but, but yeah. They usually want it in a separate bin. Okay, so why? Okay, so it could be if they have lithium ion batteries, maybe it could explode. So that, that is a consideration, but pulling it out and putting a separate bin doesn't stop it from exploding. So that's, it's a good guess, but that's not the reason. Okay. Could they do a virus scan too while they're at it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, okay, okay, so there's two reasons why. One is it actually, if you had a laptop and say a bottle, let's, let's say you had your liquids and it, it's fine, right? But you didn't actually pull it out in your bag. So you had your laptop sort of squished up against the bottles which you're allowed to carry on. It actually looks like a bomb, right? Because you see all this circuitry and you see some liquids and things like that. So part of it is, is just to, so it's not confused with a bomb. when you're just looking at the x-ray. Because the x-ray, you can't really tell what it is. You just see that it's some. Um, there's a battery, there's wires, and, and you have liquids and things like that. So that's why they want everything like in different bins uh, and things like that. The second thing is, could you put a bomb in a la laptop? Yeah. So you could, OK? So you could, um, it could actually be a bomb. And so how do I tell whether your laptop is a bomb or not without looking up? So I, I put it through the x-ray. It already looks like a bomb, so whatever. Uh, I can't really tell. So now I'm worried, is that actually a real laptop or is it not? Yeah, OK. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll ask you to power it on. Now, could you have a laptop that actually manages to turn on and has a bomb in it? Probably, right? I mean, I can, this can run a lot. This is more powerful than my laptop. It can run an operating system and it's only this size, right? So you could have like something very small and you still have lots of space left over, especially if it's an old laptop, like a ThinkPad from, you know, 10 years ago or something like that. Um, so yeah, so, so anyways. Uh, last thing that they used to do 
uh, they don't make you do it anymore is uh, they used to make you take your shoes off. Do they? Okay, not in Canada. Last time I flew, they didn't. Uh, okay, anyway, last time I flew, which was uh, earlier this year, they didn't make us take our shoes off. I'm always I'm hyper aware of all these procedures because I know I teach this every year, so I'm I'm keeping track. Uh, but in the U.S., they might still make you or uh, or it might have been like uh, longer ago that you flew. But uh, I don't doubt that you've had to remove your shoes. But anyways, in Montreal. As of a year, within the last year, you don't have to anymore. But anyways, why, why do you have to take your shoes off? Your shoes might be a bomb. OK, so someone just said everything could be a bomb. And that's actually right. So why, why do I take off my shoes and my laptop but I don't have to, you know, I don't know, like, like why, who decides that the, the shoe is really important? Okay, the story is, well, because one time, one person once actually had a bomb in their shoe and they tried to light it on a plane and they got caught, okay? So there was, there was an actual shoe bomber. Then what happened is it was front page news. So everyone knew about the shoe bomber. Right? And now everyone's scared to fly. So what do they say? They say, well, we're going to make you take your shoes off. Don't worry. You can still fly. Just we'll take your shoes off. We're going to look at your shoes. OK? Everyone's shoes that go through. OK? So it's not actually about really catching people, because there's lots of places you could hide a bomb. OK? That's, this is the critique of it. It's not really about catching bad guys, per se. It's more just about keeping people happy about flying and feeling safe. Okay, so it's very reactive. Like someone put a bomb in a laptop, now we take our laptops out. Someone put a bomb in a shoe, we take our shoes off. But then 10 years go by and there hasn't been a shoe bomb since, and now we can put our shoes back on. Okay, so it's, it's very like media kind of driven. Uh, it, the critics call it security theater. But anyways, you can make of it what you will. Okay, then uh, we've gone through security. Uh, the next thing that we may or may not do here, so it depends, uh, is if I'm flying to the U.S., I'll actually do custom U.S. customs uh, before I board the plane. Okay. Uh, if I'm flying to any other country, I'll do it after I land. Uh, but let's just take care of it here so that we. Uh, okay. So when I go to customs, finally someone's going to actually check my ID. Okay. So they're going to say, "I want to see your passport." Uh, I'm going to actually check it. I'm going to look at your face. I'm going to look at the passport, and I'm going to make sure that you actually are the person that you say you are. Generally, they want your boarding pass, not always. Um, maybe if there's some doubt about it, but I, I can't remember if they always ask for it or, or not. Um, and then any kind of like travel, like visas, that, that type of stuff there is going to get checked. So in Canada, it's called CBS, uh, Canada Border Services. OK, so what's their job? Are they trying to make sure you don't take a bomb on the plane? No. OK, so the, you already went through security. So presumably, if you got to this stage, uh, they might still care about terrorism in a more general sense. right? You're not politically affiliated with, with terrorism and, and things like that. So maybe there's some broad terrorism concerns, but it's not the immediate threat that you're going to be a threat to the airplane. OK, uh, any kind of like illicit drugs, that type of thing they care a lot about. Someone mentioned food. So there's, um, there's actually a good program, uh, like a reality show called, I think it's Border yeah, Border Patrol. Yeah, and so it shows, uh, it has a bunch of stories about this stuff. And it's shot in Canada, so you can see. And a lot of stuff is like, you can't bring food from other countries into Canada, and it's because it might have like certain bacteria or things like that that could corrupt the crops here. Or they, there might be like insects or stuff that are on it that don't exist in Canada and things like that. So there's a lot of restrictions around food, and people bring food a lot. And they don't necessarily, they're not aware of it, right? Uh, and so they don't think about it, and so then that, that's the type of thing that gets caught. Um, 
a lot of it's just like undocumented like you don't have the right visa or it's expired or you're saying you're coming to visit but you're really coming to work uh that type of thing um and canadian border services if you get pulled aside you basically like you have almost no rights at all like when you're in detention there uh and they, they can and will do everything like they'll take your phone and uh, I've seen it like someone will be like, oh, I'm just here for two weeks or whatever. And for whatever reason, they're like, oh, actually, I think you're here to work. So they're like, give me your phone. So you give them their phone and then they start going through your text messages and then they see, oh, you're like talking to somebody about like when you start your job or something. And then they call them. They're like, hey, this is Canada Border Services. We're calling like, do you know this individual? What are they? And the person will be like, oh, yeah, they're coming to work or whatever type of thing. Like they, they'll do everything. Like they'll call the people that are on your phone and they, they investigate it fully. It's just like a law enforcement uh, investigation. Um, so, so yeah. So anyways, and they can search you. And, and uh, if there was a big dispute about whether you have passwords on your laptop, if you have to surrender your password or, or not. And the, I think I haven't heard anything to the contrary, which is that, yes, you do have to. Uh, even if, if your hard drive is encrypted or something like that, you have to surrender your keys or you'll get arrested and uh, charged uh, by law enforcement. Um, so anyway, so the, the searches can be very invasive or like they, they have full privileges to search everything. Um, um, okay, so anyway, so the, a lot of it is that. Uh, and then there's stuff like, like large cash amounts. You're only allowed to uh, take $10,000 so you're not allowed to travel with more than $10,000 in cash. And on the show, there are people who like, they have all this money, but then they count it out and they're like, oh, it's $9,000 and $9,900. And they're like, okay, that's fine, go. Like, we can't do anything about it. So like, the rule's the rule, and uh, that's, that's it. Sure, they can still ask you questions about it and things like that. But you are allowed, you don't, you can just, you know, I'm bringing it for whatever reason. I want to bring it because I want to invest it or here or whatever. Like you're, you're, it's not illegal to take money across the border. Uh, it just has to get reported if it's over 10000 Yeah, you can even go, can you go with more than $10,000? You can, you just have to report it, right? And also like uh, another component here uh, is duty which is if you bring certain goods into a country, you're allowed to do it, but you have to pay like a kind of tax on it type of thing. So, uh, or there's exemptions too. Like you, um, if I go to the US, so this happens more at like driving kinds of things, but like I'm not allowed to, if I'm only there for under 24 hours, I can only bring $200 worth of stuff that I bought in the US back into Canada. And if I'm there for seven days, then it goes up to $500 or a thousand. I forget what the limits are now. So you have like daily spend limits and you can spend more than that, but, but you just have to pay duty. So it's you're duty free. You can do it. And, you know, you're allowed one bottle of alcohol or like things like that. So daily spend limits, that type of thing. So they're anyway, they're there to enforce all of that type of stuff. OK, then we're finally ready to get on the flight. Okay, now we're back to talking to Air Canada or whoever the airline is. So if I'm flying internationally, I'll wait at the line, I'll wait for my zone or whatever. What do they want to see? So boarding pass, do they check my passport? So the answer is yes, they do check it. Uh, if I'm flying internationally, if I'm flying domestically, they do an ID check, it just doesn't have to be a passport. So it could be a driver's license or something like that, but th you do have to have documentation. So you have to prove who you are, whether it's a passport or some other type of ID changes. And do they actually, is it just like, give me a copy of your passport or is it, you know, I'm gonna look at the passport, I'm gonna look at your face and make sure if it's COVID and you have to like take off your mask. Like, so it's a proper check, right? They're actually checking that you are uh, the person uh, on it. And with COVID, you have to take your mask off uh, in order to do the ID check. 
Okay. And the airline, obviously, they have a database in the background. So when they scan your boarding pass, it pulls up all the information and things like that. So if you forged a boarding pass, if the it doesn't matter, like what the database says is what's true, right? It doesn't matter what your piece of paper says or your QR code if there's some sort of discrepancy uh, between the two of them. Okay. Now this whole song and dance is meant to kind of enforce basic security properties. Um, so like you're not allowed, a, a lot of them are, are kind of obvious from the individual steps. Like I can't get a bomb on a plane, that mostly happens at step number five, the screening step, right? Nothing else is really about that. Um, but some of the properties are more global. Like if I'm on the no-fly list, I shouldn't be able to fly, right? The problem with the, that check is that there isn't one step, like where do they check the no-fly? Well, they checked the no-fly when I bought the ticket six months before, right? But they didn't actually check my face or anything like that, right? So that check, it, that check didn't completely happen at step one. All they checked was that this name that purchased the ticket wasn't on the no-fly list, but when are they checking that the person with that name is the person that's showing up to board the flight? Well, they don't check that till the very last step. Right? And then they have to put those pieces of information together to conclude the overall security property. Okay? So some security properties are not like encapsulated by a single step. And so what happens is sometimes you have oversight uh, between it. So one oversight, for example, was historically there, there wasn't this ID check at step seven. And in particularly for domestic flights. So international, you always have your passport, they check it. But if I was flying within Canada, they wouldn't check my ID at all. They'd just be like, whatever, it's a Canadian flight. You don't, we don't have to check anything, okay? Now what goes wrong if you don't do an ID check? So it's not obvious, right? You can't just stare at this whole thing and just say, oh, I know exactly what's going to go. You have to think through like, what does that mean? Like, can I fake my identity, right? And so this is why policies and procedures are hard is because it's, it's not apparently obvious what the security consequence is. And because it wasn't apparently obvious, then it was, it was left in this vulnerable state for, for, for decades. And then, so there was a researcher that sat down, uh, Chris Segoyan, and figured it all out. And so he said, okay, you know what? Uh, you can actually be on the no-fly list, and if they don't do the ID check at step seven, then you can, even though there are ID checks elsewhere and other things that are going on, the sum total of everything is that you could actually get on a flight with no ID check. Um, So basically he said, okay, what you do is you book a ticket under someone else's name. It doesn't matter. Pick, pick a random person, your neighbor or someone, and book the ticket under their name. Because if you book it under your name, you're on the no-fly list. Okay. So the airline will check the no-fly, but because it's in someone else's name, you pick someone, obviously, not one of your terrorist buddies. Right, that's on the no-fly list, but someone that's not. Uh, then what you do is you print out two boarding passes. So you have a boarding pass. We'll call them one and two. So boarding pass number one is a proper boarding pass for this other person. Okay, so it would reflect all the details of the flight. It's basically the boarding pass that you would actually get. So you show up at the airport, you say, give me, or you have the app, you say, give me my boarding pass. And this is, this is the boarding pass. So it's the real boarding pass. And then uh, you have a second boarding pass, which is fake. 
and we said that you know there's no digital signatures or at least historically there was no digital signatures or anything like that um, so this was fake at the time no digital signatures And what's fake about it is the name is different. So the name is actually your real name, or the attacker's name. OK, so when you go through security, if TSA ever asks, I want to see your boarding pass, you show them boarding pass 2. And because they don't have a back-end database to the, the, the flight, they can't tell that you're not a real passenger on the flight, OK? And even if they ask for your passport, we see that they don't ever ask for your passport by default. But even if they did, you could show them your passport. It is your real passport, right? And uh, one way to attack the system is to fake a passport. We're going to assume that you can't fake a passport. Faking passports is, is hard and expensive because there's a lot of security uh, features on it. It's not like a boarding pass. A boarding pass is trivial because it's just data. Um, so they, anyway, they can't see your flight info. And this would match attacker's passport. And then when you go to this gate, if they don't check your ID, then you can show them number one. And because they're not checking your ID, then they don't know. They're like, yeah, this is a person. They are. They do have a ticket uh, for the flight. I know their seat number. I know all of that stuff. The only thing I don't know is that this person, you know, looking me in the face isn't that person, right? And so if I don't check that, I'll just assume TSA checked it, right? TSA was checking passports, so like that was TSA's job, right? But TSA did check the passport, but they checked the passport under a different name, right? Um, so they don't do the ID check. TSA already did, or someone else already did this. And then you can board the plane. So basically, this works because nobody has a global view of the whole system. So the attacker has a passport. They have a boarding pass. And then there's like the, the flight info, which is in the database. And so the attacker has one boarding pass that matches the flight info, right? And this is all the airline sees. They don't check the passport. So they see this, and it is consistent, OK? And the no-fly check happens based on this information. It happens by the airline. Online, the person bought the ticket. They didn't identify themselves. Uh, they might have e entered passport information, but it would just match the fake person. It wouldn't match uh, the real person. Uh, but they don't, they don't ever check it against the person that shows up, right? And then TSA, border services, whoever, they're free to check the passport and the boarding pass. But if from the boarding pass, if they can't check the back-end database of the airline, then they don't know whether this person's even a registered passenger on the airline. So law enforcement, TSA, border services, et cetera, they all have kind of like this view of it, and the airline can see this, okay? And there's no one person that sees all three, and so what you can do is you can, a fancy word is you can equivocate, which means you can show a different passport to different people. So you have two passport, or sorry, two boarding passes. You're showing one to one person, and to the other person, you're showing a different one. So we call that equivocation. And there's a lot of attacks in security and even in cryptography at a formal level. 
uh, that, are, that are, we call equivocation attacks, where you're showing, you're supposed to be consistent, like this is my boarding pass, I'm going to show the same boarding pass, but, but anyways, you, you show different things depending on who you're talking to. Okay, so how do we solve it? Well, we either have one person, we, basically we have one person check all three, okay? So what's easier? Is it easier to get the TSA to check the flight info or is it easier for the airline to check the passport? Yeah, okay, so if the TSA is going to check the flight info, that's a nightmare. It's IT and uh, and then you have all the different airlines and things like that, and they all have to have a compatible system and things like that. So it would be a nightmare to do that. Um, but if you, uh, if you want the airline to check the passport, that's easy, right? It's, it's a physical document. You just look at it, and, and then that's fine. So that was the solution. So the solution was uh, that the airline would, would also basically expand what they check uh, to the passport. Okay, so this hopefully illustrates some overall lessons with policies. Um, so it's, it's easy to make an oversight. So you miss something. Uh, it's hard to design policies where there's different people involved. So part of the story here is that you have CTSA, they're doing one thing. Border Services is doing something else. The airline's doing something else. They're not all working together. They don't have all the same goals, okay? So you're trying to enforce some security property across three different people that aren't sharing information with each other. And they're, they all get to see a little fragment of the information. So we're going to revisit this when we look at browsers. In the early days of the web, it was just like you go to one website, that website gives you the, the HTML, and then you're done, right? And so the, the browser came up with these policies that was based on that model. Then it happened that now you go to a website and you're getting information from everywhere, and Facebook has their like button on it and all this type of stuff, right? But the policy is still the same. The policy was in the early versions of the web where you just went to one website and you dealt with that one website. Um, and when you split, when you're looking at a website and it's like Facebook put this here and Twitter put this here and the website put this here and they're all running JavaScript and you're trying to figure out, okay, can this JavaScript talk to this JavaScript? Then, you know, then it, it, it's easy to make these oversights, okay? And then uh, the other problem is how would you, let's say you want to prove that airport security, say it enforced this no-fly list. So I have this no-fly idea and I have this whole process. The airline, when you book it, they're going to check the no-fly and then security is going to check your password against your boarding pass and then when you board the flight, whatever. You know, I write my whole procedure out. How do I like prove, can I mathematically prove that there's no way to get onto this flight if you're on the no-fly list? Okay, so let me be different, or let me say it different. I don't want to change the policy. So that, that could be another question, would be like, how do I design the policy in the first place? But this is a much simpler thing. Airlines are working this way and we can't change it, okay? But I just want to know whether there's a loophole somewhere or not, right? So how, how am I going to do that? Like if, it's secure, like if it's code and I'm saying, oh, like I want to make sure that no one can overwrite this variable, right? Then I would like, I don't know, get a static analysis tool or something like that and it would analyze the source code and it would tell me, no, no one can overwrite that variable or whatever, right? But when it's like this kind of thing, it's hard. You could try to translate it into code somehow or logic, right? So that, that is one approach. Um, but anyway, so, so there's no methodology Right, this is a security course on methodologies. So there's no methodologies for policies. The closest thing you can do, and you see this for like more technical things like access control and uh, things like that, um, is you can do what's called formal methods or formal 
verification, uh, which is basically you model the policy like a bunch of logical rules. So you say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna translate the policy into a bunch of logical rules, and once I have it written out in terms of these logical rules, then I can ask a computer to go through the logical rules and make sure that there's, there's no way that you can, you know, if, if you're in the state of being on the no-fly list, there's no way that you can reach the conclusion that you, you get on the plane, right? So you turn the policy into a math problem or a, com a computer science problem is probably a better way of putting it. So why don't we do this with every policy that we have? So A, it's hard, right? You have to think hard about like what, like how do I translate like this human stuff into like policies? Uh, so it's hard and it's easy to get it wrong. So if I miss, if I miss something in the translation stage, I don't model it exactly correctly, then there still could be a loophole even though the model's telling me there's no loophole, right? So the model is only as good as it is accurate. Uh, so if I can't model it accurately, then the model's not necessarily telling me anything. Okay, so it's uh, expensive. If I model airport security, and then I wanna model, like when, let's say social engineering, remember that whole Amazon and they let you add a card, but they wouldn't let you, uh, they wouldn't tell you the four digits of your card. Like that's also a policy, right? They had some policy where they didn't have to do a rigorous check if you wanted to add a new card. Uh, and so if I wanna turn that into a formal logic system, can I take the stuff I did for an airport security and then use it for Amazon? I can't, right? They're two totally different things, okay? So it's expensive, it's custom, so I have to do it 10 times if I have 10 different policies. And then a mistake in modeling. means that basically there could still be security vulnerabilities that you, you're missing. Now we get better at this stuff over time and there's people who study this and, and things like that. But in the early literature, uh, the researchers that did this, like most of the problems were just that things weren't modeled correctly or they, they assume too much about something. Uh, they, con they consider it too ideal uh, but the real world was was like kind of messy and it didn't match their ideal assumption about it. Okay, so that's it about airport security. Uh, next class we'll talk about browsers and a more technical policy which is the same origin policy. Is there any questions about this? Okay, good. So I'll see you all next class.